Hi, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank Act for Sudan for this uh, great opportunity to be here today uh, and to be seen by many people and also to be heard, uh, my voice to be heard about the situation of women in Sudan. Uh, my statement, I don't want to, uh, I will not uh, read my statement, but I will highlight on the point um, about the situation of women uh, in Sudan. Uh, really, many people start from this morning talking about Sudan and genocide and uh, many problems of Sudan and future of Sudan. But I was really here to talk on behalf of women. If I'm, I'm one of the million women in Sudan had been affected. So if I'm, if I'm alone talking about myself, this means I am representing the millions who affected by the war in Sudan, in, uh, in Darfur, in Nuba Mountain, in Nabiye, in Blue Nile, and other parts of Sudan. Uh, many people talk about the, the sequence of this war in Sudan. The war started in Sudan a long time. And women become the, the, the women become the real victims of this uh, war, uh, the civil war, which is started before the independence of Sudan. I usually said it is 50, 59 years women are suffering for this uh, war in Sudan. Currently, the war which is starting uh, in Darfur and again restarted in Nuba Mountain and Blue Nile, women are facing the continuous of violence due to intensive uh, bombing of civilian, schools, churches, hospitals, farms, wells, and livestock. This is, the women are depending on this to the, 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 the nature of the future. So when they are missing all this, which had been destroyed by the, the, the bombing, that means they are suffering and they will keep crying. Since that time, we keep telling our story that we are raped, we are killed, we are tortured, we are abducted, we are, uh, we are have nothing to eat, we have nothing to, 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 to cure our illness, and all this sequence of the, the war. And people are talking about this genocide. Women are the center of, of uh, center to that uh, context of genocide. Women are the, the, the mothers of na nature. So when we are keep keep ourselves usually crying every time, every day, that our brothers are killed, our sisters, our uh, our our mothers, our grand uh, grandmothers and fathers. So. And we have, we are facing or suffering from double trauma. One trauma we are facing because of this sequence of the, the war. We are displaced. We are in the refugee camp. We are uh, we are uh, we are crying because of our uh, our identity. And the other. The trauma which we are facing that those who committed the crimes, they are moving freely. They are move, moving at any time, anywhere, joining themselves while the women are crying and suffer with hunger, with malnourished, with starvation. And they are hiding themselves in the cave, like in the case of the Nuba Mountains, 
25 become necessity. It become necessity to be implemented in Sudan. The government, because the government of Sudan is the one who is responsible of all time of the crisis in Sudan. So, and women in, uh, in Sudan, they are need a real protection and peace and security and dignity. But our question, my question, who can preserve all this for the women in Sudan? For the women in, in, in war zone area? It is And we can say what is going on in Sudan, especially in particular in Nuba Mountain and Blue Nile, and therefore is the responsibility of UN. Yes. Mm. Is a, it is not only UN, it is a, res, a responsibility of US government. It is not only the UN, UN US government. It is a responsibility of African Union. Yeah. It is a, a, a responsibility of uh, UN Security Council. And it is a responsibility of EGAD. All of them. For women, we are, we are feeling that as if they are sitting like this and watching what is going on like a film. Women are dying. Children are dying because of uh, starvation. People are hiding, people are crying every time there is a bombing. But so we are now thinking how to do as women, we start to bridge ourselves, to build a bridge. Because what is going on, it is really a heavy on women. So we start to bridge, to, to bridge ourselves and to come together, to talk among ourselves. This is not to be. We have to confront. Either those who so, uh, sit here in this morning as a position, as a political, we have to say, no, this war should be stopped. <laughs> we have to, to also to confront the government of Sudan through our bridge that you should stop this war. Because we are also feeling that we women of uh, affected with war have least access to the justice from the international community. If yes, it is a time now to start. It is not tomorrow. It is now. Because all of us here, we are concerned about human rights. We are concerned about justice. We are concerned and we talk every time, everywhere about this but how to put it in practice. The practical sense of doing that is of starting, not to talk. Because the theory is over. Practical is now needed. Our recommendation to US government should consider the, the protection of women in the conflict area uh, in Sudan, in the their second uh, round. The UN, the, the UN Security Council and EGA and African, African Union to enforce 20, uh, 2046 on Nubu Mountain and Blue Nile. And there should be sanction of violation, uh, violence, and we also uh, want to see the negotiation and women to be there in that negotiation. It is not just a woman who are just to complete, complete the, the number of the, the people in there. We need the real women who are, uh, who are no, and they have idea, and they, uh, they are well, well uh, equipped to talk on behalf of women to get 
the right and to, to know what is going on and to enforce our agenda on that thought. And there is a question, to, a last question to the, to the government, uh, to the U.S. government. Now Sudan become a crisis. A crisis not just for Sudan. It is a, a become a crisis in the sub-Saharan Africa countries. It become a crisis and a headache for the international community. And everyone uh, from this morning we are talking about, and they are talking about the arrest of, uh, of, uh, of Bashir and his cabinet, or most who uh, committed the crime. What does the, the, the U.S. government want to do, uh, going to do uh, to the crisis currently in Sudan? Because it is now it is a crisis everywhere. And we, we, we appreciate what the, the U.S. government did in the past since that uh, peace talks and end with the separation of South Sudan. Now, as a part of Sudan, they uh, become a, a problem now. What can we do to end this headache, which is usually we are talking about? Uh, there is someone who said, Bashir is not big, to, uh, big uh, person, or he is not going to be taken to the, uh, to the, to the, to the court. <coughs> He's like me. He can be taken to the court. Why not? Do we are just uh, talking to, 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 uh, to, uh, to consume our time, and many people are dying and women are dying? We have to. So I'm here today because I'm one of the affected. And I'm here to say one hand cannot clap. This is what we are uh, hearing from our grandmother. It, can we try to, 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 to prove one hand cannot clap? Can we, uh, we try? Can we try? Let's say, let's uh, try. My hand is this one. Is it clap? No. Let us put our hand together. <laughs> we, when we put our hand together, we hear. The one in the corner there, he, uh, that uh, woman, uh, my sister there, she, she hear that there is two hands put together and there is a clap. The, the sound of the clap. The other one is there, there also. So we are here to put our hand together, to clap together for one action and one, uh, one, uh, one action and one solution. Thank you very much. Across uh, the states, uh, you find uh, people that are passionate about what's happening uh, outside the world, uh, trying to push uh, the government uh, and the international community in general uh, to deal uh, with the problems uh, uh, of people whom uh, they have never uh, seen. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, for that uh, very much. Uh, we are uh, here, all of us, because uh, we are driven uh, by a moral uh, sense uh, that there are uh, issues in Sudan that should be uh, dealt with and that there are wrongs that should be uh, corrected, that there are human rights violations that should be stopped, and that there is uh, a government that destroys its own people, and it should be stopped from doing so. Uh, we are motivated uh, but what, by what uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, said, uh, that injustice uh, anywhere is uh, a threat to justice uh, everywhere. Uh, with, with this spirit, uh, the whole uh, world, uh, from the United States of America to Japan, uh, has been uh, exerting enormous uh, efforts uh, to stop the war in Sudan, uh, to help the Sudanese people uh, shape a better future for themselves over more than 10 uh, years. Uh, for the last 10 years in particular, after the uh, breaking out of the war uh, in the western part of the country, uh, the world has increased its efforts uh, to uh, deal with the uh, chronic uh, problems of Sudan, war, uh, uh, lack of freedom, 
and uh, the involvement of the government in uh, killing of its own uh, people. Uh, Ten years later, we still uh, see that uh, this uh, war is still going on. Not only is it going on, but we also see that it is uh, spreading in other areas, in the Nuba Mountains, in Blue Nile, and maybe tomorrow we will uh, witness more wars in the eastern part of the, of the country, and maybe even in the central or not on the northern part of the country. That is only because uh, there is uh, one uh, uh, problem, which is the problem of governance and the problem of what my uh, colleague in, on the last uh, panel uh, mentioned, the problem of identity. The main question, the fundamental question, is why are we still unable to put an end to what's happening in Sudan? That is what I will address uh, partially, and I will, will focus on two or three points because uh, we have a li I have a limited time uh, right now. Uh, one thing is, uh, is that we uh, see that the international community uh, deals with the ramifications, uh, replications of the uh, problem, uh, rather than the uh, fundamental or the main cause of the problem. We deal with the symptom rather than the disease. And that is why we are not able to put an end to what is happening. Uh, I, will, I, will, I am not going to, re, uh, to, to repeat again uh, what uh, my colleagues uh, said. That the fundamental uh, problem of Sudan is the wrong definition of the state of Sudan. Uh, Sudan was, was uh, established actually as an independent state in 1956, as we all know. Uh, in the state of, establish, of establishing uh, an accommodating state, a tolerant state that tolerates uh, uh, religious diversity, political diversity, ethnic diversity, Sudan was established a distorted state. A distorted state that uh, doesn't uh, recognize uh, diversity, that does not tolerate uh, ethnic uh, diversity or religious diversity. And that is where all our problems uh, come from. And unless we deal with this problem, we are not uh, going to put an end uh, to the crisis that is going on in Sudan. Now what the international community is doing is trying to uh, speak about people who are dying in Darfur, uh, people are hungry in uh, the Nubo Mountains, and people are arrested in Khartoum. Yes, that is, that, that is uh, a problem, but it is not the fundamental problem. That is a, a one uh, a symptom of the problem, a ramification of the problem. Uh, yeah, they might say that uh, dealing with this kind of issues, the definition of the state, or uh, establishing a state that is accommodating, that is tolerant, is a constitutional or internal constitutional issue. That is true, but it is also an international issue. When I speak about establishing an accommodating state, I speak about establishing a human rights state. I speak about multiculturalism. I speak about citizenship. I speak about tolerance. These are no longer uh, local issues, they are no longer constitutional issues, they are uh, international issues, they are your values, American values, and they are uh, values of the, of the world, the whole uh, international society. And that is why the, 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 inter the intervention of the international community uh, to deal with these issues is very crucial, and it is not something uh, that they uh, would do outside their mandate, it is uh, an essential uh, part of their mandate. It is part and parcel of their mandate to deal with this issue, the, uh, the problem of uh, the fundamental problem uh, of Sudan, uh, which is the uh, main uh, problem of all uh, the other uh, problems. Uh, that is one. Two, uh, I also uh, noticed that throughout the 10 uh, years, uh, there is a lack of consistency. Uh, is the policy of the international community in general. And that is for a, well, uh, a, a good reason or a reason that is uh, known to everyone, which is that we have a very diverse international community, uh, one of the main uh, correct characteristics of the international uh, society. Uh, when we speak about the international society, we speak about the United Nations, we speak about the African Union, we speak about the Arab uh, League, uh, we speak about the United States, we speak about China, we speak about Russia, we speak about many other players. And in order to have an impact, in order to, uh, to, to change uh, a situation in any country, we need to have a united uh, position. 
we need to speak with one uh, voice, or at least we need to have uh, a strong voice within the, within the other voices. And that has not uh, been there in the past 10 years. Uh, the United States is the main uh, player, if not the main uh, player, on the international scene. And uh, when the United States moves, the world moves. When it, it, it sleeps, the world sleeps. When the U.S. doesn't move, uh, so does the world. And that is why this summit is important, and that is why whatever, whatever any American citizens uh, does here in the United States uh, counts. Because it is uh, the United States that can uh, uh, actually uh, make the rest of the world uh, pay attention to the problem that is going uh, on in the, in the forum. And I'm not saying this uh, because, uh, only as a dream. Uh, it is uh, actually uh, supported by evidence uh, that we have seen at least twice. In 2005, when the United States uh, stopped strongly uh, in the, uh, the Security Council uh, to uh, make sure uh, that the case, the situation uh, of Darfur uh, would be referred to the International, community, to the International Criminal Court, uh, it was uh, able to do so. China uh, gave uh, actually uh, guarantees to the Sudanese government that it would not allow uh, the Security Council to refer the situation of the court to the International Criminal Court. Uh, Khartoum was actually uh, sure that the case would not be referred to the International Criminal Court. But when the uh, United States uh, to get, uh, joined forces together uh, with, the, uh, with, with the United Kingdom and France uh, here in New York, uh, that uh, happened. Uh, oh, that is uh, actually one ex example that we need uh, always to take into consideration when we think of uh, the role of the United States of America. Uh, this can happen uh, actually uh, also when we speak about the African Union, when we speak about the Arab uh, League, the U.S. maintains uh, very good relations with many uh, Arab countries, uh, including Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and many others. And I think it can use it is, uh, relations uh, to uh, pressure uh, the Arab states uh, not to support uh, the Sudanese government in committing human rights violations. They can do so by stopping financially supporting Sudanese government, and they can do so by uh, pressuring uh, the, their uh, friend in Khartoum not to be involved in human rights uh, violations. Uh, that is uh, true also. Uh, when we speak about the other uh, uh, countries such as Russia, Iran, and, uh, and the, uh, the European Union, of course. Uh, this, uh, the last point that I would like to mention is that uh, the uh, fragmentation of the Sudanese uh, opposition uh, groups uh, has always uh, been also uh, partially responsible uh, for uh, the failure of the uh, policies uh, made of the international community uh, uh, that is also something that we can deal with as civil society organizations. And that is why it is also necessary uh, for uh, groups uh, such as ACT for Sudan and any other active organizations uh, to engage directly with the uh, Sudanese opposition uh, groups and uh, help uh, these groups uh, unite. Uh, and that will uh, certainly uh, actually uh, have uh, a bigger impact on uh, changing the situation in Sudan. Uh, that is, uh, in short, what I wanted to share uh, with you today, and I thank you uh, very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Uh, yeah, Dr. Salomon Baldo, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, and like and all the activists who are around here, uh, in support uh, of, of justice and human rights uh, in uh, the most beleaguered uh, Sudan. Um, personal thanks, therefore. Uh, and I want to lay out concretely uh, how international policy has approached conflict resolution, peacemaking, and, 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 and peacekeeping uh, in Sudan, precisely in the way uh, my friends Zainab and, and uh, Nasruddin have uh, addressed which is addressing the symptoms rather than the core problem. At the core of all Sudan's conflict are, of course, chronic, uh, chronic and, and uh, structural uh, issues of governance, 
uh, of, of lack of tolerance of diversity or of acknowledgement of diversity. At the core of this problem is deeply seated uh, racism with some Sudanese in the ruling elites believing that they are better human beings than other Sudanese. And as long as these issues are not addressed in the core, conflicts will continue repetition. Now, what are the main weaknesses of international policies towards the resolution of these conflicts? Uh, let's start 10 years back as we are mandated for this session, you know, international policy. The process that led to the Naivasha process, it was built on sequencing. That is to say, the main mediator, the IGAD, a regional organization, and its friends in the international community, who were very well organized and effectively so, in the friends of IGAD forum, the US, the United Kingdom, and Norway, uh, by providing support for the regional mediator, but leading, leaving the lead to the, to the mediation. They had a policy of really focusing on the north-south axis for resolving the, uh, the conflict in, 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 in South Sudan, and then addressing the other conflict that started bubbling up. The future, the constitutional future of the state in Sudan was being decided in Naivasha, in Nairobi, in Kenya, and all the other marginalized regions were not going to sit, you know, sack it, as we say, you know, quietly while, you know, the future is being decided there. So we saw the eruption of war in, in Darfur, we saw the eruption of war in, 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 uh, uh, in uh, also in, in the East, but there was a deliberate decision not to pursue this, you know, uh, the head of UN at the time was touring capitals, trying to alert Bukash Kabilos here, my witness, to alert to the disaster that is unfolding at that very moment, and there was no way of diverting attention away from real focus on the North-South. So uh, the negotiations between Northern Sudan and, and South Sudan to end the civil war there were actually between two ruling parties, both militarized, both ideologically entrenched. However, the ideology of New Sudan, of John Garan, who headed the SPLN, had transcended the North-South divide. And therefore, there were regions in northern Sudan who fought the war on the side of South Sudan. The negotiations focused on the north-south axis, on the transitional zones to address the grievances of these regions, and therefore we had the three regions, you know, the three areas, and to resolve the root causes, the democratization, the democratic transformation of Sudan. When you look at the implementation during the six-year transition mandated by the CPA, it was implemented at different speeds, with a lot of focus in pushing for ceasefire respect and implementation of security arrangements between the North and the South, less emphasis on the transitional areas, which you know, the agreement gave them some, uh, you know, some, some autonomy, but also promised popular consultations and no follow-up at all by the IGAD or by the friends of the IGAD, therefore members of the international community leading among which are the U.S. for the democratic transformation of Sudan. The government was given free reign to really then indulge into a policy in which it's an excellent performer, divide and rule. The government is not successful in dividing and rule only of its opponents, whether armed insurgents, as is happening with the Darfur movements, but also of political opposition and of the international community. 2006, Khartoum was negotiating with the Eastern Front in, As in Asmara, with the mediation of the government of Eritrea, leading to the Eastern Front, you know, the, the, the peace agreement for the East. 2006, it was negotiating with the Democratic, uh, National Democratic Alliance in Cairo with the mediation of the intelligence services of Egypt, you know, the government of Egypt, Omar Suleiman, leading to the agreement you know, between the government and the NDA. It was negotiating with the rebel movements in Darfur, the Darfur movements in Jemena, with the mediation of uh, you know, a totally sold out mediator to the government of Sudan, at least Debbie at the time. He was actually, you know, the government of, of, of uh, you know, Shad actually amended the agreement after his signature to suit demands from the government of Sudan of what should be that agreement. 
That is how corrupt the system was, you know, at the time. And the Khartoum was allowed to get away with this, with the complicity of the international community. That complicity could be seen in, you know, uh, in a, a diplomatic device, uh, which was, uh, you know, then, you know, the Darfur uh, negotiations moved to uh, Abuja, uh, and, and uh, in Abuja, a lot of pressure uh, was put on the Darfur movement, as explained in earlier discussions. Uh, there was a provision for those movements that didn't sign Abuja Agreement, which is called a, a Declaration of Commitment to Abuja Agreement. You know, for those who are joining the Abuja Agreement and Abuja process after the fact, after signing. And such signatures were endorsed and hosted and sponsored by the African Union with the support of international actors in Addis Ababa. So the government was able to continue the process, you know, feeding and stoking the process of a splintering of the Darfur movements by inviting individuals who lost their, you know, real hold on, on, on their own troops on the ground, who were tempted by the, uh, you know, the, the uh, compensations offered by Khartoum for, for joining such agreements. And the political process actually added to the phenomena of the splintering of the Darfur movements to a point which made it almost impossible to reach political accommodation because the Darfur movements were so scattered and divided that it was impossible to, to have them agree you know, on, on a, a joint negotiating platform, let alone on, on, on uniting or really integrating uh, to, 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 to join the, the peace process uh, together. Uh, as a result uh, of this, Khartoum was able uh, to prevail. We look at what happened after you know, Addis uh, Ababa and the uh, declaration of commitment. Uh, the focus of the international community was trying to lead the groups of Darfur movements uh, into you know, unifying so as to approach the Doha process. Again, uh, the process, the political process, was a way of weakening the Darfur movements. Rebel commanders from the front line were flown to Doha by the dozens, by the hundreds, for over the two to three years that the process lasted, Khartoum was very happy to authorize the United Nations to take them to Doha at the request of the political commanders, but not of giving the same authorization for them to go back to join their troops. So the political process was actually used to siphon out the most effective rebel commanders from the field, you know, and enable Khartoum to prevail on the military side of the ground, while in, in Doha, the continuous manipulation of the divisions and feeding of new divisions, and, and, and at the time, God knows how many dozen rebel factions were formed and dissolved and recom, you know, recommitted, you know, and, and, and formed new rebel umbrellas, with the end result that, you know, the integrity, the consistency of the Darfur movements was forever uh, compromised thanks again to the manipulation of uh, Khartoum of uh, an international diplomatic process. You look at the mediation in Doha, and there is a problem there. Doha, you know, negotiation was led by an envoy who is supposed to be a joint envoy for the United Nations and the African Union, Ambassador Vassoli. It was hosted by the government, very generously, I must admit, you know, of the government of uh, the Emirate of Qatar. In the Arab Muslim world, uh, these this are 15 minutes remaining, we need to stop <laughs> uh, in, in the Arab world, it was Qatari mediation. No one talks about the, you know, the United Nations or the African Union. For the African Union, it was basically their person. But the United Nations had a very marginal role in supporting Basoli because you know the currents were in you know that close. African Union at the same time had a parallel mediation mechanism for Darfur, that of you know President Mbeki panel. 
It's a multiple head of former head of state, but it's known by Mbeki panel. The high, uh, you know, its latest incarnation is the high, you know, African Union high implementation panel for Darfur. It was mandated in 2009 for Darfur, uniquely. And then in 2010, given the mandate to implement its recommendation for Darfur, but also to address implementation of the CPA for the West Sudan. This is the only official remaining mechanism to resolve the problems of Sudan, North South, SPLM North with the government, therefore everything, you know, the official body today is the Mbeki panel. Uh, however, uh, again, you know, Khartoum has managed to divide uh, the international community at the level of peacekeeping. You know, you have multiple peacekeeping forces, UNIFSA in Abyei, you name it in, 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 um, in Darfur. Tell me about a country anywhere in the, in the world which has four peacekeeping mechanisms for one country. You know, with now South Sudan independent, and of course, uh, United Nations mission, peacekeeping mission and, and, and stabilization mission in South Sudan. But in Northern Sudan, there are three United Nations mechanisms that are not allowed to exchange information or intelligence by their agreements with the government, because the government ensured that this does not happen. So uh, I believe everyone has to have a, a second look at their own performance vis-a-vis -vis the regime in Khartoum. Khartoum is excellent at divide and rule. It has succeeded to exhaustion in dividing the rebel movements in, in Darfur. It has succeeded in dividing the United Nations, African Union, and within the United Nations, getting what it wanted with regard of making sure that there is not one effective peacekeeping mission that keeps the issues of peace and human rights on track in the country. And the challenge, therefore, comes back to the court of the rebel movements in, in, in Darfur, for example. As long as I see you know, three movements, even under one umbrella, such as the Sudan Revolution in front, but three and more rebel you know, movements speaking on behalf of Darfur, I continue to worry because they are simply playing in the hands of a, a very good poker player with, with these issues. You know, they, they will continue to divide and prevail. This is what has happened before. This is what will happen again. With regard to international policy, the lesson learned is that you will need an integrated process that goes through all the mediators with influence in, you know, in Sudan and on Sudan. And by that, I mean the African Union, the United Nations, the uh, other sub-regional bodies you know, uh, have to agree to some, uh, to some mediation strategy, and countries with influence in the region, Dr. Suleiman, if such as the United States of America, America and, and, and uh, France, and, and, and you know, Norway, and so on. And without that, you know, divide and rule will continue to be the game of derailing all peace efforts in the country. Thank you.